Good to see you all this morning. This is our second virtual Bible study that's taking place on Facebook. And last week I said that we were going to have a special guest, and, and that guest was my wife. Uh, this week, uh, not my wife, uh, but one of my old Old Testament professors. Old. Old as in well, from my for, past. Thanks from, for uh, mentioning yes, that. Yes. yes. <laughs> I can see I'm already to a great start. <laughs> but uh, how are you doing, Dr. McMath? I'm doing well, Stephen. How yeah. are you? I'm, uh, I'm hanging in there. I'm, I'm working from home mostly, but um, it's been good. Uh, it can be sometimes distracting having a refrigerator so close by uh, your, your workplace, <laughs> but I, I'm still uh, able to get a few things done and... Um, what about you? Are you working mostly from home? Uh, entirely from home. Uh, been uh, been teaching. That's right. Uh, the uh, uh, Moody Aviation students and yeah. uh, uh, a variety of people in uh, the Philippines and Italy. Yes. Uh, yesterday, I had uh, about a hundred online at one time. <laughs> I yes, and I was able to catch the tail end of that. You've been going through Romans on yeah. Zoom, which if you don't know what Zoom is, uh, Zoom is a great thing to be owning stock in right now uh, because <laughs> all across the world, people are figuring out how to use this online. How would you describe it? Like a it's like a tele meeting. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a conference. Yeah, video system. Mm -hmm. You've got a camera looking at you, and yeah. uh, you can see people at their computers. Yeah. It can be a little startling. I'm not sure if anybody imagine. actually understands that mm -hmm. that computer has a camera in it. Yeah, uh, and you can see them, and yes. yeah, and we can see each other. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so you do that, at, what, like once a week, once every other week? Uh, Three times a week with Italy. Okay. Uh, and I was doing twice a week with uh, Moody Aviation. Okay. Uh, but uh, I finished up the, the uh, aviation group. Okay. So, yeah. I, yeah. So, yeah, just to uh, give It's a, not nearly as much fun. As, as actually being there. Yeah. When you can uh, slam some books with and so faces. so many of these things, you've got to be there. <laughs> it, it's like... Right now, you know, we can only be... Oh, that's right. Yeah, I came in and I wanted to give him a handshake, but yeah, he had to remind me. Oh, so, yeah. The, it's a uh, fist bump instead yeah. of a handshake. It's not good. So all that being said, if you are interested in wanting to learn a little bit from the Book of Romans, it sounds like three times a week, and you're posting that on Facebook, right? And Yeah, that's coming up on Facebook okay. uh, in the... Uh, I don't know how to do Facebook, so yeah. uh, the... The video, once I process it, ends up on the John McMath news feed. Okay. And uh, Rebecca McMath, speaking of which, is watching. She is, uh, and we have seven other, ten other people watching now. So more people okay. are coming on as we speak. And uh, so one of the things that I really like about this whole setup is that it's not so much that we're trying to do like Good Morning America with the book of numbers. That's, you know, we're not just trying to uh, broadcast with the lights and everything so we can talk about some Bible topic, although that's fun. We're not a Christian edition of The View. Uh, I hope not. Yeah. We'll, we'll see how it goes as, as the hour progresses, but uh, I really hope not. Um, one of the things I like about this is that as we are doing this, you're watching this live, uh, so this is not pre recorded. So, uh, if you are watching, we encourage you right now to open up a Bible tab or maybe grab your Bible and turn it to Numbers chapter 22 because Numbers 22 is what we preached on last Sunday. And traditionally here at the church, the men's Bible studies and the women's Bible studies have gone through whatever was preached on the Sunday before. I, I guess they just really like to critique me, Dr. McMath. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> but that's typically what we do. So... Uh, as we're doing this, make sure that you have that passage open. And as we're talking and discussing, I would love to hear questions from you guys. Are there any uh, questions that you guys had about the passage? Was there anything that I brought up in the sermon that maybe gave you one or two answers, but gave you 20 more questions in replacement? Uh, now is the time to do that because we're going to try our best as we're discussing to uh, read your answers, to see them in real time, and to try to discuss them. So, and remember, this is not just you getting to ask the pastor. This is now you also getting to ask the pastor and a former professor of the pastor, a professor in <laughs> Old Testament, which, what do you know? Today we're talking about uh, Balaam out of the book of Numbers. So let's 
turn to Numbers chapter 22. Dr. McMath and I are both on our devices here. And I have a little bit of an admission to you, Dr. McMath. I don't know if I, I should share this, but I think I'm Probably going not. to. Probably. But uh, for the sake of TV, I, I'm going to, just so uh, the people out there know that I'm human. Um, I remember freshman year, Moody Bible Institute. You know where this is going. Uh, so fall semester, uh, sitting in Old Testament survey. And by the time I had gotten to Moody, I'll admit, I had really read up on a lot of stuff before coming to Moody. So I knew the five points of Calvinism. I knew I had read Ryrie's Dispensationalism. But I, re I remember sitting in Old Testament survey, and I knew about Balaam. But you want to know what surprised me, what you taught me about Balaam? I did not realize that Balaam took place in the book of Numbers. <laughs> I thought... Well, how about that? I, I didn't really think much anything interesting really happened in Numbers. I figured that was in Second Kings or something like that. <laughs> wow, really? Numbers? Uh, who knew? Maybe I should. Uh, I really ought to check out that book again sometime. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> it's always a little shocking to me what freshmen don't know. Especially with the Old Testament, I imagine. Uh, to a large extent with the Old Testament, but it's, it's surprising what they don't know Not just about that. virtually everything. Yeah, yeah. Especially the ones who already know everything. Of course, yes, yeah. exactly. Because that's that's how it is when, when you show up to Moody as a freshman. You know everything, and oh, you yeah. just assume yeah. that Balaam's yeah. somewhere in there and the histories or whatever. And, yeah, they uh, can't, can't be too important. Why do you think it is that people have such a a smaller view or maybe a smaller knowledge of the Old Testament as compared well, to other the, the Old Testament is, uh, is big. Mm -hmm. uh, it's history. And uh, uh, unless you take the time to work through some of the framework details, yeah. it's really hard. Yeah. Uh, the... Uh, once you understand the historical framework, then you can begin putting the poetry and the prophecy into place. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's not it's not a quick and simple thing. I, yeah. It's not the kind of uh, material that lends itself. Yeah. To uh, you know, ten steps. Yeah. In a yeah. Wednesday night Bible study. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. I I was trying to think through that question myself of. Because I grew up having heard all the Bible stories, Old Testament, New Testament. I knew about Balaam. But I never really felt like I was taught real context of, of how it fit in, what books of the Bible these take place in. Yeah. Uh, like maybe I did with the Gospels. I feel like growing up I had a much better understanding sure. of the Gospels, sure. maybe even early church. But not so much with the Old Testament. And I maybe think some of that is because pastors are so afraid. It's so hard to preach the Old Testament um, like I was thinking about that in our focus hour with, with Ezekiel when, when God's presence leaves the temple. Yeah. What a beautiful and powerful thing to preach on. Yet yeah. it's so long and it it's so illustrious over what, five, six chapters. Yeah. How do I turn that into like a three-part series or how do I turn that into a verse by verse? It's so hard. So I think as a result, guys who love the pound of pulpit and say, we only preach verse by verse. <laughs> they put themselves in a hole where they have no idea how to preach Ezekiel. Yes. And I, I can empathize with that. <laughs> that's, uh, that's absolutely correct. Uh, much of the Old Testament is, uh, well, simply long. Uh, yeah. Like Isaiah. Yeah. Very long book. Yeah. And much of it really, really, really difficult to understand. Yeah. Uh, to, to preach that, you just about have to do chunks and discover what the overall themes are. Yeah, that's what I do with uh, stuff like the Book of Numbers. Yeah, I mean, in the Book of Numbers, you've got people going from one place to another. It's mm -hmm. a travel log. Yeah, uh, it's know. really called in the wilderness. It's not really called Numbers. It's, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It's a uh, you know here we are walking around in the wilderness. Yeah, you know, see that over there? Those are rocks. Yeah. See that back there? That's more rocks. Yeah, uh, yeah. And in between is a whole lot of nothing in particular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and along the way, we're going to have an adventure. Yeah. Maybe. And what strikes me is that even though Numbers takes place over 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, yeah. we really only get 
what, two and a half, maybe three years of real yep. storytelling, which I think that in itself could really be a spiritual point. I know we're talking about Balaam right now, but but just even the book of Numbers on a larger whole. Yeah, the book of Numbers starts out with the preparations to uh, uh, take the people into the promised land. The whole point of Israel being brought out of Egypt in the book of Exodus was to bring them in yeah. to the promised land. That's the whole point. Uh, and so Numbers starts out, first 15 chapters, the preparation to get to the promised land. Yeah. The people are lined up like an army. They're set out with a pillar of fire and smoke. They're, yeah. they're given the, all of the resources they need. Yeah. Spies are sent in. Everything is ready to go. And the spies come back with a bad report. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, that, at a place called Kadesh Barnea. At Kadesh. Yeah. That's the crux. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and when the, uh, when the people of God refuse to accept the blessing of God, mm. Yeah. God says, fine. Yeah. So take another lap around Mount Sinai. Yeah. It's like what C.S. Lewis says. He says that God is the divine gentleman. He says, either my will be done or eventually thy will be done. Yeah. God, God does allow that. And that ultimately brings us, not ultimately, but to this point anyways, it brings us to Balaam, uh, which is so surprising to me because really... It seems even from Genesis, it's like we're looking at this narrative of this really special group of people that's really not so special, but God decides to make them special, the children of Abram, of Abraham. And we're following their little story, and they're the heroes, but sometimes they mess up. And and now they're on this winning streak as they're coming up north through Edom and through the Moabite Plateau. And then out of nowhere, uh, the the protagonist of the story becomes... This foreign warlock guy with an eye patch, maybe you know, like <laughs> what's going on with that? You know, why why would God choose at this point in the narrative to decide that He's going to use maybe the most unlikely of all characters to have a pretty pivotal role in in, in what's going to be taking place with with the Israelites right now? Yeah, Bal- Balaam is not only unlikable, uh, he's... Yeah, keep talking. He's not a nice guy. Uh, what makes you say that? Uh, there's, an, uh, there's an awful lot that we know about Balaam uh, that's uh, not necessarily clear from, uh, from the passage itself. Yeah. Uh, his, uh, his name is an Akkadian name. He was, uh, he, he was a yeah. part of the Mesopotamian... Um, yeah, divination culture. Yeah. Now, what, now, what do you mean when you say words like Akkadian, Mesopotamian? Okay, Mesopotamia is the land between the rivers, and this is where Abraham came mm-hmm. from. Mm-hmm. When Abraham was a pagan yeah. uh, in the land of Aram or <clears throat> the mm-hmm. uh, the land of the Amorites beyond the river, uh, he spoke Akkadian. Yeah, uh, and uh, his uh, his father. Terra spoke Akkadian, yeah. worshipped the moon. All of that was going on yeah. back there. Uh, Mesopotamia was a uh, was a vast uh, civilization yeah. uh, at this time, and a very very important part of Akkadian civilization was uh, uh, their their devotion to the gods. Mm-hmm. Uh, multiple gods, thousands of gods. It seems like moon. It seems like the moon seems to be a a big one. You hear a lot of the sun, various stars, uh, uh, physical objects, uh, bits of nature, uh, the thunder, the lightning, you name it. Uh, Anything that people would would think to say, wow, isn't that something? Yeah. Is given a name, uh, and a, uh, somebody builds a temple yeah. and insists that you bring sacrifices. Yeah, um, Balaam fits into that whole mm-hmm. thing, which I and and I hope I'm not digressing too much here. But I think what you brought up was kind of interesting in the sense that yes, Balaam is a foreigner. He's from this northern land of Mesopotamia, which means what, like between the waters or between, between the rivers, the rivers yeah. Tigris and Euphrates, um, and. As did Abram. Yeah. And Balaam is someone who was familiar with these foreign gods, even more so than he should have been, 
as was probably Abram. Yeah. It seems like Abraham and Balaam are two characters that, as the little Sunday school kids sitting in church, you would think are polar opposites. Yeah. But in some ways, their origins are a little bit more similar. Their origins are similar. And, and the, the reality is that uh, Balaam uh, chose to stick with the dark side. Yes. Uh, Abraham walked into the light. Exactly. So it was very, yeah. very different. Uh, so yeah. uh, uh, Balaam comes from, well, I guess we could say, Abrahamic roots. You know, they're, they're back there. Uh, but uh, Balaam has uh, achieved notoriety. Yes. Which yeah. is interesting. Which is even found in his name, which I went on a limb and made the claim that I, I feel just in the evidence, and by evidence I mean the commentaries that I've read, yeah. that the name Balaam probably was not his given name, or it was an incredible coincidence, or he was part of a family business. Because the name Balaam, from what I found, means just destroyer of, of peoples. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's one of the possibilities. It depends on how we okay. Depends on how we analyze it. Uh, uh, one of my sources says Balaam means the divine uncle brings forth. Oh, divine uncle, yes, Uncle Balaam, yes, Uncle Balaam, hmm. um, which doesn't mean anything at all. I like destroyer better. Well, of course, yes, yeah. absolutely, <laughs> and just I, like, yeah, like Gideon means uh, smasher. Does Gideon mean smasher? Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. Because he, he, he mashed up those, uh, uh, the, uh, oh, what was that? The Asherah pole. There you down. go. Yeah. He, he's the okay. chopper, the smasher. There you go. And that, it's, so Balaam's name may have been given to him later. That's yeah. really, very, very true. But it's probably given to him by his pagan peers. Okay. Um, Which I think uh, is important. Yes. Yeah, go We for have it. a collection of Balaam's curses. Did you know that? Outside of the Bible. Really? One... This is true. Okay. Like... It was uh, okay. found in uh, in Jordan, just across the river from Israel, uh, in the nation of Jordan. There's a place called Deir Ella, uh, and the British excavated there back in the 50s. Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, part of what they found was a collection of Akkadian clay tablets uh, with uh, curses. Yeah. Uh, a curse for every season. Yeah, just you know, uh, like, uh, like chicken soup for the soul. You know, you have a chicken soup, a, a little, child's yeah, yeah. garden of yes, curses. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, it's a whole collection of uh, Balaam's. Uh, Is this like papyri or no, it's stone? Some clay? It's oh, clay, okay, clay okay. okay. Yeah, uh, and uh, these have been translated, and, uh, and it's a it's a collection of Balaam's favorite, most eloquent curses. Interesting. Now, we don't absolutely know for sure that all of these go back to Balaam himself. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. You know, there's some, there's some question about provenance. Okay. But what's, uh, what's clear is that uh, the name Balaam is clear there, and it's associated with these things. Uh, so there is a long tradition in the pagan world yeah. uh, for over a thousand years of Balaam as the great cursor. Yeah. He is the, something I like to say, uh, he is the Billy Graham from <laughs> Cursing Prophets. Yeah. You got somebody you need cursed? Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Who you I like to call? You come to me on the day of my daughter's wedding, you, you know, to the Moabites. Yeah, we'll, yes. Yeah. yeah we'll, my... we'll have a conversation. <laughs> we can talk about this. Yeah, we'll get it done. Uh, yeah, Balaam is a, He's a very famous and apparently very powerful yeah. cursing prophet. Now, here's a question that, that I had, and I had messaged you yesterday because yeah. I feel like I haven't really gotten to the bottom of this. Because our discussion right now... There's been a lot of work done on Balaam. There hasn't been? There hasn't been much Well, we need to get on it then. Well, you know? well, <laughs> or one of you guys, guys yeah. need to get on it. But um, Which is a shame because... I'm having a lot of fun with Balaam. I just yeah. think it's a, yeah. no pun it's intended, fun. it's a wicked fun uh, oh, it, yeah, yeah, situation. Yeah. But I guess, you know, when I think of, of Balaam, okay, he's this guy from Mesopotamia. He seems to have a, rep a good reputation for his craft, which is cursing people. He has the name Destroyer of Nations. How common 
was Balaam's occupation. What well, was Balaam like one of a large field of cursors that he happened to be at the top of? Is this the kind of thing that we see commonly in this time and in this region? Or I is this say yeah. commonly? Okay. No. Okay. Uh, certain pagan priests within the within the Mesopotamian religious uh, panoply yeah. uh, would specialize. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there were uh, there were a variety of different specialties. Uh, Balaam seems to have specialized in uh, uh, what we call divination, animal divination. Mm-hmm. He would watch birds fly across the sky or ants go across. Everything's the ground, an omen. Or, Everything's a sign. Everything's mm-hmm. a sign. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you do a sacrifice. And and Balaam maybe. would be the one who yeah. would read the entrails. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you open up the liver and yeah. open it up and read the flukes. Which is not just Mesopotamia. You see that happening with yes. Mycenaeans. Yeah, yes. With Romans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Everybody, yeah. Everybody does that. Uh, and, uh, Balaam went through that route and within the, within the, uh, the Baru prophet specialty, the mm-hmm. divination specialty, uh, he learned the power well, of the dark side. He, he learned how to depend on Satan and yeah. uh, and Satan's emissaries, which stand behind the pagan gods. Yes. That's, the, that's a really important thing. The pagan gods are nothing. There, there is no Zeus. There is no yeah. Ishtar. Balaam was not actually talking to other deities. He was he talking, talking to, to the adversaries. Deities. He was yeah. talking to familiar spirits, demons. Yes. Yeah. Uh, with tremendous power, with Satan's Absolutely. power. Yeah. That he was far too comfortable with. And he was very comfortable. He had, I believe, that the the old, uh, uh, the Faustian bargain, to sell your soul to the devil. Mm -hmm. I think this is something that Balaam had done. Yeah. Because he was so good. Uh, The phrase that comes up, for I hear uh, it said that uh, he whom you bless is blessed and he whom you curse is cursed indeed. Yeah. What verse were you looking at there? Uh, I was uh, I was reading twenty two six. Okay, so if you guys have your Bibles, be looking at twenty two six. This is well, that just briefly twenty two six. Yeah. You know, I know know that he who you bless is blessed, whom you curse is cursed. Strangely enough, all we have on record uh, for Balaam outside of the Bible yeah. is his curses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a big collection of curses. <coughs> it's like. Uh, you know, he could bless if he wanted to, but yeah. he didn't usually want to. And, and his uh, his top 40 were curses. It's like we're back. Are we back? Well, we will see. We'll have you guys let us know. We know a few people were complaining about interruptions. <laughs> Can you guys see us? One, one of the downsides of living in paradise yeah. is that it's a long copper wire to everywhere else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but you want to know something interesting, um, and this is really you know quick quick side tangent. But when we do this on Sundays, every Saturday night we come. The people who help set up, we set up every single thing. We run through every single thing. We double check, triple check every single thing. Yeah. And on so far, so good. It's worked on Sunday. Uh, last week we did that with our Bible study. This week. Uh, I'll just come in in the morning. We'll see how it works out. And so that is a uh, valuable word for the power of a preparation because uh, <laughs> hopefully things are a little bit better now. Everyone's complaining about interruptions, but I think that we're on a better network and I think things should be a little bit cleaned up. So we'll just uh, keep on going and we'll just do what we can do. And worst case scenario, we'll just uh, upload this as a recording later on. But uh, we like like we were saying we are in the book of numbers um, we're in numbers chapter 22 and you were talking specifically about how we don't know much of Balaam other than his curses yeah outside of the Bible what we have is curses uh, and what's uh, what's fascinating about that collection of curses at Derala in Jordan uh, is uh, the vocabulary yeah uh, uh, and that gets technical, and I can't I, I can't really demonstrate a lot of this because I don't have Akkadian. Yeah, I don't have cuneiform at all. Uh, but the the specialists 
who have looked at this uh, have compared the vocabulary of Balaam's blessings on Israel mm -hmm. with the vocabulary of Balaam's curses at Deir mm -hmm. And the, the technical terminology that Balaam uses for cursing outside of the Bible yeah. is the same vocabulary that Balaam uses. Interesting. For, Interesting. Uh, the, the, and so he took up his oracle. Yeah. It's a technical term. Yeah. Uh, it's for uh, cursing prophets did this. Uh, this is this is what it means. So, and he went into his windup. You know, yeah. Ah, well, yeah. we know what that means in a baseball game. Yeah. Uh, and he took up his oracle. Uh, is yeah. the same thing. Yeah. It introduces the the <clears throat> beginning sentences of uh, of an oracle. Anyway. Yeah. So yeah, and some of this. I mean, he's, he's quite a famous guy. We're we're in an interesting spot here because we're in the middle of two really big things going on with Balaam. One we covered last Sunday, but the next one we're going to cover this Sunday, which yeah. is so. Last Sunday we we covered more of the narrative of the kind of trilogy of the Moabites come, he sends them away, they come again. Okay, he comes, but he is kind of coy. He doesn't. He's not being completely obedient. Yeah. Yeah. Then there's this whole thing with a donkey, and that's really the that, that's the Hollywood stuff right there. Yeah. That's that's the part that we really love. Um, yeah. For me, and if there's any points that you bring up, you know, just just let me know if you want to take a different certain direction. But I know for me, one of the questions that I had that I'm still trying to sort through is how in the world does Balaam have the gall, <laughs> or or where does he get the right? Number one, to even know about Yahweh. How does he even know about Yahweh from where he's at? And number two, the fact that he can call him my Lord and my God. Yeah. What's, I mean, what's going on with that? Okay, that, it's actual, that's a good question. Uh, and uh, uh, people who read this without, without a lot of context uh, often will say, well, Balaam was a wayward prophet. He was a prophet of God. I've heard that, yes. Who had his problems. And, yeah. Uh, now he's trying to come back. And, prophet in exile. A prophet in exile, mm. something like that. Uh, that's not true. Um, yeah. Uh, there's. Uh, I think the Quran actually pushes that. I, I think that's a Muslim. Yeah, it's I, I'll, I'll say you something. I'll I, I, I've heard that that's a Muslim. Th yeah, yeah, that's uh, a very Islamic. interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. Oh, the, the, the the Quran has a lot of misinformation about the Old Testament. Uh, I would say so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 I, that's a that's a whole other story. Yeah, and we're not, yeah. It's what we sometimes call a rabbit trail. But yes. let's go back yes. to this this question of uh, Balaam's knowledge of God. Yeah. The evidence that we have uh, shows that the. Uh, the Mesopotamian prophets in general, and the cursing prophets in particular, uh, used a, uh, a handbook of deities. Okay. Uh, so uh, at, at least the upper crust guys like Balaam, uh, who had an international ministry, mm -hmm. they, they would get on their, uh, get on the Gulf Stream and uh, jet off to wherever. Yeah. To, okay. You know, they, uh, you, you've got to you've got to have your briefing papers. Okay. Uh, and so the uh, uh, the backup guys uh, would say, "Okay, you you need the file on Israel." Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's a thin file. They've only got this one God. Yeah. And Balaam is thinking, "Well, oh, that makes it easy. Yeah, I've nice and easy. Yes. Okay, <laughs> what do you call him? Okay, God, of course, Elohim. But uh, mm -hmm. it, uh, his name is Yahweh." Uh, and uh, he's to be addressed as my Lord and my God. Yeah. Okay. Uh, gee, that's really simple. All I've got to do is use the correct ritual sayings. And he just, he's plugging things into a formula. Yeah. In other words. Uh, so. I, like metric to imperial. Okay. Yeah, the, these guys, okay. Yahweh, this yeah. name I'll use. Okay. This fits yeah. with them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if we're if we're, uh, uh, if, we're if we're going to Moab, let's uh, yeah. let's do what the Moabites do. Yeah, uh, and if we're going to go to Israel, we've got to do what the Israelites do. Mm -hmm. And you just learn the lingo and learn the uh, learn the specialties. Yeah, I think that that's uh, that's probably very likely uh, that there was some kind of an Akkadian briefing book, probably a collection of clay tablets with all the names of all the gods of all the nations that okay. they knew about. Yeah, 
Yeah. Uh, we have some of those, but we don't have a complete selection. Because it's been almost 40 years now since the Exodus has taken place, and, yeah. and we would assume um, the Egyptians, they didn't just uh, stay within a one-mile radius of the banks of the Nile. They uh, actually were much more well-traveled than people realize. They, yeah, on the international trade routes going mm-hmm. right through this area on the yeah. King's Highway. King's Highway, uh, which is even mentioned, I think, earlier in yes. Chapter 21. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. the Israelites say, we're going to stay on the King's Highway, we'll leave everybody alone. Yeah. Not, not good enough for Moab. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so well, I, I think they knew. I think I think they yeah. knew. What do you think? And I mean, we're all just conjecturing right now. But what do you think the attitude was towards this guy? Do you think that he was taken seriously as a god among the bunch, or was it just seen as a silly little trifle? You know, not not up to the big boys of, of these other. Uh, national gods, anything that you know about that? Uh, their view of Yahweh, they knew about the crossing of the Red Sea. Yeah. Uh, that was uh, that was well advertised. Hmm. Uh, the, uh, especially these nations round and about. Yeah. Uh, they know that, that here is a God who is empowering a people who are defeating us at every turn. And not only us, they defeated the Egyptians. Did you hear what happened to the Egyptians? Yeah. That, even CNN would cover that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You I know, mean, that's that, that's a big deal. I mean, Egypt, Egypt was a major power. And yes. the fact that these... The major power. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, the, uh, the Mesopotamian uh, world at this time, there was nobody there. Uh, the, the Hittites were in... The area we call Turkey, yeah, and the 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 group in Mesopotamia that ruled the thing was called the Mitanni, uh, and they knew better than to get anywhere close to Egypt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there mm. was there was just there was no there was no question. Uh, so for for Israel to have defeated the Egyptian army, especially by a miracle, mm. yeah, yeah. Oh, they got good juju. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who's the name of that juju? Well, that would be Yahweh. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah. So okay. I, I think it was well known. Yeah. Okay. So we have this character named Balaam, who uh, Balak, this king of Moab, is uh, sending his princes to, sending his men to, in, in order to summon. It also says that there's some Midianites who seem to be involved in this as well, which I found a little bit odd because um, when I think Midianites, I think more Jethro, uh, friends of the Israelites, not necessarily enemies of the Israelites. I mean, even Balak's father is named Zippor. That sounds pretty familiar to another Midianite name that I know of, which would be Zipporah, the the, the, the wife of Moses. Yep. Um, I, th- I thought that was kind of interesting. But, yeah, it's the same language. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so they go to Balaam. They ask, will you come? Will you curse? He says, let me think about it. Let me talk to the gods. Um, and then we get to this whole kind of conflict where God says, okay, if they ask you to, you can go, but you should only do what I say. Um, it seems like Balaam does that, but then God gets really angry. God stands in his path. Yeah, all kinds of stuff we could unpack there. Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff we can unpack there. The, the the fact is we don't know exactly what is going on because the Bible doesn't tell us. Yeah. Uh, but what we can assume is again, yeah, you know, presuppositions are dangerous. Yeah. Well, what we can kind of assume is that God told Balaam, "You can go with these guys as long as you only do what I tell you." To. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so inside Balaam's skull mm-hmm. was going on the, a, a, a different intention. Well, I'll go with these guys. I'll pretend to do what God is telling me to. Exactly. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, at exactly the right point, I'll sneak in yeah. uh, my own intentions. This halfway kind of thing that we all tend to do, and someone's calling the community center, which I have no idea why, but um, <laughs> that's weird. Uh, no one's home. Yeah. But 
Isn't that just so common? You know, when, when I saw that part with Balaam and really trying to unpack the emotion and the intention, and you're right, we can't do too much presupposing, but, but we can look at the context of what's going on. We can see it happen in many other places in the Bible that we tend to be like that, yeah. that we like to be like the little kid that when mom says don't touch, okay, we don't touch, but like we do this whole thing with it and we try yeah. to get as close as we possibly can yeah. and and we you know maybe taste it, but well, I didn't touch it, but I tasted it and yeah. just kind of yeah, this halfway. I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. that seems to be what's going on with Balaam. And that, I think, is all Christians at some point, if not <laughs> at a lot of points, where we obey God insofar as it's comfortable for us. Yeah. Insofar as but it But with fits. our own intentions right under the surface. Our own agenda. Planning to get away with as much as we can before he slaps us down. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how can we use God to benefit me as part of my plan right. so that I can obey him so that he favors me, so that things work out my way, uh, but so that I can still lead my life in the general direction of what I want? I mean, as a man, I struggle with that. I'm always fighting that temptation. Yeah. Uh, even, I mean, this is a little bit of a joke, but but even with our coronavirus drive, <laughs> We are asking for supplies, and I mean, what do you know? We're getting all kinds of soap, all kinds of different um, cleaning materials. One thing we're not getting any of, though, is toilet paper. <laughs> I almost wanted to type a little parable of uh, the woman with the two coins, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. and then do a modern day parable of everyone brings. Uh, Giant Costco packs of bar soap, and you know they roll out giant tubs of dish detergent. And the, and the little woman, woman brings her last, roll. yeah, her last roll of toilet paper. The Babylon Bee. Exit. There you go. I'll send it into the Babylon Bee. Yes, a picture like that. That's uh, we like to serve God as long as it fits in to our general plan or agenda of, of how we want to live our lives. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I couldn't help when I looked at this, I don't know if it's a valid one, but it's one that I can't help but making. We did for Samuel last year. I couldn't help but see some similarities in what Balaam is doing here. And so many times what Saul yeah. did uh, in, in first Samuel where, okay, yeah. I'll obey you God, but I'll try to obey you my own way. Yeah. And, and in a way that, that fits me where I'm actually the God. Uh, I'll, I'll try to obey the letter of the, mm -hmm. of the instruction yeah. without actually having to do all of that. Yeah. Totally. Totally. And that all leads to this um, okay. mysterious, strange, debate-inducing, head-scratching character coming into the middle of the road. Yeah. Known affectionately as the Angel of the Lord, sometimes yeah, or capital L O R. Mr. Ed. Mr. or Mr. Ed, <laughs> yes. A horse is a horse, of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah. What's going on here? Uh, <laughs> yeah, the Angel of the Lord was, uh, was standing there. The, the Angel of the Lord is a complex character. Uh, totally, because is he Jesus? Is he just an angel? Yeah. Is he some kind of manifestation the, of the Father? The very I mean, early church, yeah, uh, particularly Origen. Origen yeah. popularized it. He, he wrote commentaries about virtually the whole Bible. Yeah, uh, and uh, uh, every chance he had, uh, he told us that the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Christ. Yes, uh, uh, and so the early church made this a, a popular. Yeah allegorical understanding of the uh, of the angel of the and Lord. by allegorical we mean symbolically yeah different uh, things represent a, you know pilgrim's progress everything you know, represents what, what is this angel of the Lord well it's actually Jesus oh okay and that was very common I I don't want to take your thunder but that was very no, common no. of that stage of church history yes where they wanted everything to be Jesus yeah. um, yes. some and I, I want to be careful here but some even throw in a little bit of maybe anti-semitism maybe into yeah. that as to why they felt that way, but kind of this desire to whitewash as much of the Old Testament as they could with yes. as much 
It's kind of one new. of the uh, mm -hmm. one of the classic ways uh, for Christians to read the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Uh, just try to find Jesus on every page. Yeah, uh, and there's no question in my mind that the Old Testament uh, sets the stage for Jesus. It I is mean, our it, schoolmaster. It's as the Paul calls it's it. the road to Christ. Yes, it brings. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we do find Jesus in the Old Testament. No yeah. question about that. Yeah. But there are a lot of places where the early fathers thought they saw Jesus. Where really? Yeah, he probably wasn't there. Uh, he, he's a part of the story, but he, he, he probably wasn't there. The red rope coming out of the wall of Jericho was probably a red rope. Exactly. So when, <laughs> yes, yeah, so with not, Rahab, not of the Jericho, person. yeah, you see the red rope. The temptation is you want to take that and you want we, to... We want to, yeah. we want to get it down on all fours and run with it. Yeah. Uh, but it's not necessarily so. Um, modern... Modern technical theologians, yeah, the kinds of guys, guys way above my pay mm -hmm. grade, mm -hmm. who are arguing Trinitarian theology. Yeah, I have to be careful here because I'm, I really am, speaking outside of my specialty. But the guys who are doing that have been telling us for oh a hundred years or so, be careful with this angel of the Lord stuff. If this is the pre-incarnate Christ then what does that say about the uniqueness of the Incarnation? If Jesus showed up whenever it was convenient and disappeared whenever it was convenient yeah. in order to do a variety of things, yeah. Um, yeah. what are we saying about mm -hmm. the uniqueness of the Incarnation? Why was that a big deal? Jesus just yeah. showed up again for another 30 years and then went away. Uh, and I'm going to push against that a little bit just for the sake of discussion. And I think you're ultimately going to agree with what I have to say. Yeah. But we don't want to have a pendulum swing of that argument and go into another extreme where we think that the second person of the Trinity did not exist before the Incarnation. Oh, no, no. Because no, no, no. I think that can be no. – it's an important reminder to recognize – that the second person of Jesus, as Jesus even said in John chapter 8, he was present and involved in the narrative of God's people and the narrative of history because he was there from the beginning. Yeah. And that shouldn't be yeah. forgotten. That, that does Not exist. Not only yeah. from the beginning, but before the beginning. Totally. Right? Just as God. Yes. Again, another mm -hmm. really important part of uh, the modern technical Trinitarian argument is the eternal generation of the Son. Yes. This is one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, again, this goes all the way back to Chalcedon. Uh, it's something that I kind of understand. Uh, Jesus has always been the begotten Son of God. Really? In all eternity past. He, he's always existed in eternity past. He has past. always mm -hmm. existed. He has always been the second person of the Trinity. Yes. Has always been the Son, the begotten even okay, so I feel like I'm play, I'm going to play devil's advocate one more time. Even in what is it, Psalms chapter two, when there seems to be some pretty clear language that says, "Today I have begotten you." Yep. Um, that seems like it's talking about a pivotal moment where the second member of the Trinity has taken on the role of the Son. Yep. Uh, would you say that that fits in, or is that not even talking about Jesus? Is that another example of? You know, is that just David? You know, uh, no, that and, that is talking about Jesus. Is also talking about David, uh, and uh, the, the 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 Psalm two formula. I get okay. what you're saying. It's, it's ambiguous mm -hmm. because okay. of the adoption formula in the Old Testament. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is my son. This day I have begotten you. Yeah. Uh, uh, those of you who hear my voice this day, uh, uh, hereafter you must hear my son. What, yeah. what he says, other contracts he makes. Yeah. Uh, I will. Yeah. You know, it, it's the. There, there are parts of this that are the coming of age. Okay. Um, okay. Ceremony. Okay. In Judaism, this is the bar mitzvah. Okay. Uh, but the okay. the child who is bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah. Has mm -hmm. been alive and well for quite a while before. Yeah, there's almost more of a parallel to Jesus's baptism than it would be his birth 
from Sony yeah, still. Yeah, I, yeah, I would say yeah. that uh, yeah. that's a good parallel. Yeah. So sorry to uh, take us down no, this no, path, no, but I think that this discussion. There's a couple of things that Thursday I morning is a good time for rabbit trails. I mean, hey, in <laughs> something like Balaam, I'm enjoying Balaam because I think it brings out so many of these important things. Yeah. And there's things that, you know, in a sermon, there's always this idea that you have to have a driving point in a sermon. Yeah. Sermons really are not the time for rabbit trails, but but Bible studies can be. Um, Nobody and I, ever told me that. I I need to go uh, back I and think so. I, I remember enough of your sermons. I think, I think maybe <laughs> once or twice you've heard that before, Dr. Yeah, Brad. well, okay. But, uh, but we need to go back to this angel of the Lord yes, for just a second. Yes. If we say that the angel of the Lord is probably not the pre-incarnate Christ. Mm-hmm. This isn't Jesus walking around in uh, incognito. Yeah. Um, the angel of the Lord is a really, really important character. Mm-hmm. There are places that we run into the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament yeah. where he has all of the authority of God and even answers to mm-hmm. uh, the name Yahweh. Yeah. So th- this is yeah. a kind someone, of potentiary. Uh, someone even worshipped, not Melchizedek, but someone else worshipped yeah, yeah, to uh, yeah. the angel of the Lord. Um, yeah. Do you remember who I'm thinking of? I yeah, I, 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 yeah. I, I know what you're. If Kimmy was here, this is where Kimmy shines because she just has. She that, would just uh, find it. She, she can do that. She's, Donna yes. could do that if she. Could, yeah. Uh, can you get her? See, we need your help, people. We, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Donna. If you're listening, you know, maybe you need that's to comment what the phone in. was about. Maybe she was trying uh, to phone a friend. Yes. Fix it for <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, I know there's a place. Um, I can't remember. Yeah, I'll have to look it, it up. Could be in uh, the Abrahamic uh, uh, thing because the the three angels who I came, was thinking one that, of those was yeah. the angel of the Lord. And uh, I think there's another one though, but I cannot. I'll have to look that up and get back to you. But any, but yeah, you're right. That's powerful stuff. He seems to. Yeah, we're calling it very here, very you know? powerful stuff, yeah. uh, and uh, that that would mean that in a Trinitarian sense, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are represented in all of their power in this angel of the Lord. Yeah. Uh, uh, so maybe not the pre-incarnate Christ, but yeah, Jesus is certainly yeah there. So so here's the way I take it, and I have felt pretty comfortable since probably my senior year of college okay. taking this approach. Uh, I may look back on this stage of my life and just say that I was totally ridiculous in doing so. But I know in this whole discussion, there's this major question that pastors have and theologians have, which is, should you have what's called a Christocentric view of the Bible? Um, should you have a Christocentric view of preaching? When you preach a sermon, should it be? Should Christ always be at the center of everything? When you preach on the Red Sea or David and Goliath, do you need to find how somehow, some way, Christ is like the stone that David throws, or <laughs> or he's the water that parts, or you know the red cord as you mentioned? Like, how can we find some kind of symbolic way? that Jesus is present. And, and I think, and we both agree that uh, strongly, no. We, uh, the story of the Bible is God-centric. Uh, it is for the glory of the Father, of which Christ plays a part, and he even admitted so during his earthly yeah. ministry. Yeah. Yeah. However, um, for me, I have tried to take an approach where I follow a God-centric hermeneutic, always, always a God-centric hermeneutic, but I try to follow a Christ-centric homiletic in this sense, that every sermon that you preach from God's word, if it's a good sermon, needs to lead to some form of spiritual application. Yeah. Because we're preaching to the church, we're in the church age, That's right. We, <clears throat> the only avenue of our spiritual application is through Christ. Yeah. So, so for me to say, oh, well, the point is you need to treat your wife better. Well, that's not actually the true point. The, the point is you need to love Christ. Um, and by loving Christ, he will equip you to love your wife. Yeah. Christ is the avenue of application. Yeah. So in every way, we need to look at the passage of Scripture, see what it says, but then point to the reality that exists today. And, and what I see here is... We don't know who the angel of the Lord is, but this is a person that was sent by God and represents God to some degree. Oh, to a, to a very high degree. To a very high degree. Yeah, but In the same way, uh, 
years later, God would send an even better, yes. if not equal mediator, person to stand in our way, and that person is Jesus. Yeah. So even if the angel of the Lord is not Jesus, which people are going to argue and debate that, uh, what yeah. it represents in this narrative as this mediator standing in the path, sure. uh, flaming sword in hand, the way that we can apply that today is to look to Jesus as the ultimate fulfillment of that person that God has sent. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. Uh, two things I'll, I'll mm-hmm. say about uh, Christocentric interpretation. Yeah. Uh, uh, because I think it's actually really important. One, on a on an ontological level, on an existential yeah. level, on, yeah. the, on the most fundamental level yeah. of all, as it exists in itself, I think the Old Testament points to Christ. Totally. Uh, I think the Old Testament lays, lays a foundation for the coming of Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, uh, the prophecies, the symbols, the, uh, the movement of the uh, chosen line, the, yeah. uh, the development of the law leading to... Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. You, 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 you look at all of the components of the Old Testament, uh, they are laying a foundation uh, for Christ, uh, while at the same time being complete in themselves. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the story of the Old Testament is complete in itself. Yeah. Uh, but, but history is never quite finished. We, we have a trajectory that begins... Um, with the Old Testament, it comes to, you know, an unsatisfying conclusion. Yeah. Uh, Silence. And, uh, here we are, yeah. exile, come home, yeah. little bitty temple, uh, rabbis, yeah. uh, silence. And then the New Testament takes it on to the proper conclusion. It, it, it's like the uh, the chords that close out a, a bit of music. It yeah. finishes yeah. it properly. Yeah. I, in, uh, everything is resolved, you know. It's like uh, Old Testament. You have these minor chords. There's tension, and then you have resurrection, the future of a second coming, yeah. fulfillment of millennial kingdom, new heaven, new earth, major chord, G. Yeah. Yes, oh, oh, oh. yes. Um, yeah. Good. Uh, it, it, so, yeah. so it's all there. Yeah. Um, it is all looking forward to Christ. Uh, I think on uh, on another level, as uh, as a pastor, uh, your job uh, is to help a congregation see Jesus. Yeah, I would say so. You are, after all, a Christian pastor. Yeah, yeah. you're allowed to read the it, Bible. It's twenty twenty. Yeah, I, I think There's that's a resurrected. Uh, book. I, I yeah. think that's. Yeah, precisely right. We yeah. don't have to put this in some kind of a historical, yeah. hermetically sealed vacuum. Yeah, thing. where it's yeah. Uh, too many commentators do that. Yeah, uh, they they go to uh, particularly the Old Testament. I uh, say, well, well, this book of Isaiah was uh, was written all about the Babylonian captivity and all of its principles have to do with Israel during the seventh yeah. century BC. And I think well, that's that's crazy yeah 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 <laughs> I think there's more going on there yeah uh, on a uh, on an existential level and there's more going on there that Christians ought to be able to yeah to read so when we see Balaam encountering the angel of the Lord I don't think it's a wrong application mm-hmm. yeah to exactly. say that the Balaam head has come to Jesus moment here. exactly that's the key but interpretation, yeah. we need to be careful. So, yeah. All, yeah. all that being, yeah, it, it depends on whether I'm doing theology, yeah, or application. And and I think sometimes pastors, uh, and I need to be careful because we need to recognize that that this is a Bible study and that's not just happening amongst <laughs> pastors. But just speaking on myself, I think sometimes pastors forget that. I think sometimes pastors just want to be theologians, or they don't want to be theologians at all. <laughs> and, and we need to find a middle. So moral of the story, Christians, we need to be reading our Old Testament. We shouldn't be treating it like the Chronicles of Narnia where we're trying to find <laughs> Aslan in every corner. But we should see that the trajectory of this story is building up momentum, pointing to, illustrating, as Hebrews says, what God is going to fulfill perfectly through the man God, 
Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Um, so we have about three minutes left. Yep. Let's uh, let's talk maybe just two minute drill on this donkey, and and we'll oh, end on yeah. the donkey. What what is going on with this donkey? Is there anything that we can glean as to why God? We talked about it a little bit during our sermon, but why God would choose to pull this little number out and. Uh, my my favorite verse in the whole passage. Yes, I know where uh, you're going. I know. Two twenty nine. Why don't you read it for us? Okay. <laughs> Two twenty eight uh, says the the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and she said to Balaam, "What have I done to you that you've struck me yeah. these three times?" Yeah. And when, when you look at that, you look at the vocabulary there, and you look at the sentence structure. Yeah. That's that's really a nice. It's rather clear, relevant. straightforward, very honest, mm -hmm. reasonable question to ask. But this is a donkey yeah. talking. Yeah. Uh, and the very next line says, and Balaam said to the donkey. Yeah. All uh, pastors, yeah, we love, yeah, th th there's just something inherently funny about that. That's just funny. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in Hebrew, Vayomer uh, Balaam, which is like the quotation marks. Uh, it's absolutely no emphasis. Uh, we've got a horse at home named Summer. Yeah. Uh, if Summer looked over at me and said, you fool, I said <laughs> three <laughs> slices of hay, not two. Yeah. I yeah. would grab the horse by the... Uh, yeah. Say that again. Yeah. One more time, please. What do, what yeah. Do you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, I would at least, yeah, show some bit of surprise. Balaam is not the least bit surprised. The matter of factness, yeah, and the fact that he has servants with him, yeah, and we don't see them uh, saying, "Hey, boss." Uh. <laughs> this is one of the things that makes uh, uh, scholars convinced that yes. the Balaam is yes. an animal diviner. Yeah, he was used to getting information from animals, perhaps. He had even spoken with animals before. Yeah. Satan can do that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not sure that Balaam knows that this isn't Satan yet. It's it's definitely, and, and this is a point that I've heard other people bring up. Kimmy says she remembered you bringing up this point, and I think it's an important point to bring up is that uh, this is not a cute Disney moment. We, we no. look at this, and, and it's <laughs> it, it's easy to look at it that way because there is something somewhat funny about just the way it's written, yep. and it's a natural story to tell children because <laughs> kids love talking animals. <coughs> uh, so we want to see it that way. But the flannel graph, he's really cute. He's a real <laughs> cute guy, but this is demonic or uh, satanic. Um <clears throat> Balaam is satanically inspired. The donkey was getting its power from uh, from God. Good distinction. Yeah, good distinction. Uh, and so what we've really got here, we've got a conflict building up. Yeah, yeah. Between Satan on one side and God Himself on the other side. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With with Balaam uh, representing. Yeah. Uh, Satan. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Uh, and uh, here, here the donkey is representing the Lord. But later on, we're, we're going to see uh, that, that God is heavily involved in this whole yeah. story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he's speaking Next through week. the donkey. You, yes. you, you knock it off, Balaam. Your, yeah. your way is contrary. Yeah. yeah. The things that God, the things that, it's, it's a two-sided coin. The, it's interesting to see the things that God will use to communicate to us to get our attention. Yeah. But on the other hand, it's also interesting to know what Satan will use to stand against God. Yes. And so I, I think it's good that you brought up that distinction. I think sometimes people ask, well, why do these things not seem to happen anymore? Why don't we hear of people talking to Satan and demons? Or why does it not seem to, why do we not seem to live in a spiritual of a world as seems to exist back then? And, and first off, I would say is, oh, this world is, is definitely still just as spiritual. It's just you don't live in that part of it any, anymore. Yeah. Um, I, I would say that's one point. Another point is that Satan will use, Satan will speak through whatever will best get in the way between us and God. And uh, for us Americans, um, 
we have TVs, <laughs> we have computers, yeah. we have plenty of things that Satan speaks to. So um, as we come to a close here, are there any, I know that there's going to be so much good stuff coming up next week <laughs> with these oracles of Balaam yeah. that is going to be impossible to really accomplish fully in one Sunday, but I'm going to try my best to find that one driving point, which, which I think there is one, I but, uh, as we look at this first half though, Balaam coming down South to the Moabite plateau, uh, being stood in the way by this angel of the Lord being talked to by a donkey. What are some takeaways that we should have? For I would say that, you know, that even Satan's chosen, fully empowered, thoroughly ungodly representative can only do what God allows him to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really that That, that would be my walk away uh, yeah. with this thing. I, I, I think Balaam was out of his league. As shown through a donkey. Yeah. As shown through yeah. a donkey. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Satan has power. It is power that is allowed by God, and it's not even passively allowed by God. It is directly allowed by God for his own purposes, which is, I think... Precisely for his own purposes. That's something we forget. We yeah. forget that when we read those oracles. Mm -hmm. This was Balaam attempting to curse Israel, doing yeah. his very best yeah. to curse Israel. Yeah. And yet the blessings form such an important yeah. body of truth. Very good. Well, Dr. McMath, I just want to thank you uh, for joining us this morning. We're going to have to close. I'd like to, and I think a lot of people would love to just hang around throughout the morning, but we all have things to do, and there's only so much bandwidth that we can suck up at, at any given time. So we'll have to come to a close. Uh, hopefully this is a good precursor for this upcoming Sunday sermon. I don't really like to announce sermons very much but obviously when you're doing expositional verse by verse sometimes it's pretty predictable uh there's going to be some pretty powerful stuff happening this sunday and uh maybe we'll have to have you back maybe one more time just to try to figure out what's going on with all these oracles we'll, 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 we'll oh. see what, what plays out but uh uh dr mcmath if you could close us perhaps in a word of prayer i will do that uh, everyone watching thank you for joining us yeah, you we guys, appreciate this. This has been fun. Yeah. Uh, we, I know you're out there. Yes. We see you <laughs> We see in you spirit. in that circle of light. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, continue. We're going to continue to do this on Thursdays. Let us know how we can make it better. Uh, if a better, if a different time would be better, let us know. Uh, if something, if another format, you know, whatever. We're, we're open to, su to suggestions. So thank you all. And Dr. McMath. All right, Father, it's uh, it's good to be together, even though we're apart. Uh, we're the body of Christ. Uh, we love one another. Uh, we enjoy being with one another. We love to study your word together. We love to hear from you. Yeah. Your spirit is among us. Where two or more are gathered together, there you are in the midst of us. And yeah. even when we are together on this crazy internet, yeah. uh, you you are with us. And we thank you for that. Uh, Father, we thank you for the encouragement of your word. Help us to understand it better. Help us to, to see the detail here that applies to our own lives. Uh, help us to be strong men and women who, when we hear your voice, willingly go your way. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. And thank you all. We are bye -bye. signing off. <laughs>